Hey everybody, this is Ross Ratty, and uh, welcome back. Welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. If you guys are new to growing food, I think this is the episode for you because we're going to cover a ton of topics in uh, this episode of Fruit Talk. Um, really, we're going to explain just a number of different things that are going around in the backyard right now. Things that I have to do, um, things like maintenance, things like even, you know, planting we are believe it or not still planting even into early june now um we're also getting a lot of harvest right now and there's just a lot of like overflow there's a lot of content i've been filming a lot and um i actually have more videos than days of the week so it's um it's kind of crazy and actually normally i think things really slow down around this time and I really just focus on harvesting and that's solely it. But there's actually quite a bit to uh, pay attention to and that's what I'm doing. I'm really focusing in on a couple things here that uh, I think I otherwise didn't necessarily do last year or this year didn't necessarily, or maybe I just learned this particular thing. I, you know, so it's kind of like fresh in my mind. It's it's um it's just one of those things that you know I think I'm sort of excited about because it's fresh and new, right? Um, so let's kind of just get into some of this stuff. What what is going on in the backyard? Um, man, there's so much. So the mushrooms we've been talking about for a while, and the mushrooms we started wine caps in the backyard, and we talked about. A little bit about that in uh, I think last week's episode and also on the YouTube channel we've talked about it in pretty good depth but we have had wine cat mushrooms just been popping up all over the place in um, this mushroom patch that I inoculated last fall and a lot of you guys have been giving me some pretty good feedback you know first I wanted to make sure that it was actually legitimately wine caps and then I wanted to see what you guys thought about when to harvest them what's like the best time um in terms of the the quality of the uh the mushroom the eating quality of the mushroom um some of you guys have been giving me taste reviews and different notes about the flavor and you wanted to know what i thought about the flavor um i actually did a video uh that's gonna come out i don't know when exactly but we did a video of me in the kitchen um cooking up the wine cap mushroom and um what i've noticed with the wine cap it has a very interesting texture to it unlike other mushrooms and i don't exactly know why and maybe it is you know variety dependent in that the wine cap is kind of just like this or maybe it's because this is a homegrown mushroom I don't necessarily know but the texture is quite crispy um, reminds me a lot of when you cook up garlic or potatoes and they get really crispy and um, it still retains the dense center like a potato or, or garlic would but the outside is really crispy and even almost crunchy um, and that's sort of what this wine cap mushroom is when I saute in olive oil or butter whatever it is um, and you really get a lot of that water out of the mushroom it is incredible it's really good it's got a really intense like button mushroom flavor um, people had wanted to know what it tastes like to me because they didn't think it really was the best tasting mushroom. I would agree. It's not really the flavor that I'm in it for. It's really the texture. I'm really in, uh, overjoyed. And what's also pretty strange about the wine cap that I have discovered is that it's been quite dry here. And the few wine caps that have been popping up because it's, it's so dry, they actually stopped um, fruiting. But because it's so dry whatever had popped up really dried up outside on their own and you don't even have to have a dehydrator it seems like they're pretty much on their way to like almost like a piece of bread that went stale and started to like um become harder on like the outside edges and like the whole thing is just becoming like very um 
just it's just losing a lot of its water. And I've found that to be very strange. I mean, although I don't really have much experience growing mushrooms, this is really the first one that I've ever grown. It just kind of blew me away it, to, to see that the mushroom, at least it, I think that's what it's doing is that it's drying outside. Um, and you can almost pretty much, I mean, I could really take them up off the ground. So I have a number of them just sitting there on the ground. Some of them are, are still uh, on their fruiting bodies on the stems. You know, I could very easily take them inside, finish them off a little bit in the dehydrator, and they're pretty much dehydrated. Um, my question to all of you is, what do I do with all these dehydrated mushrooms? Because there's so many mushrooms. I can't eat them all. I can't keep up. I don't cook mushrooms enough to be to have this many mushrooms it's just it's just crazy so i've been giving enough of them away which is good people i think have been enjoying them um so that's awesome i overall i'm just overjoyed i think by the whole experience of growing mushrooms and i'd like to definitely try some others there was a a pink oyster i think i read about that supposed to taste like bacon i mean that sounds nuts and i think most of the oyster mushrooms are relatively easy to grow um so i might be able to i think the pink oyster i might be able to get that to work on straw if that's the case i think that would be wonderful and i would probably create myself maybe a, a straw bed i know there is a type of oyster that grows on straw i just can't remember which one it is um but if i can get some like mushroom bacon that'd be <laughs> pretty cool huh um what else has been going on? So we're actually selling some trees. That's an, like an announcement I want to make. We have a couple trees here for sale. Nothing crazy. Things like Improved Celeste, the Magdalene, Cavalieri, Long to Do. Have them here on Figbit here, guys. On the uh, You can find this link on uh, any of the descriptions of any of my videos I put out on YouTube. You'll find the link here. Also on our website, figboss.com, there's a link to the store. Uh, what's pretty cool is that I've um, I did create a video. It's going to come out hopefully, probably I think maybe maybe even before this video comes out, maybe before this podcast comes out, um, describing what steps that you should take when you receive the plant in the mail. Um, and then this video is going to actually be on the listings of all of my um, my trees for sale in the future. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. I've actually had a, a video, a couple videos, one that we did on rooting instructions and handling instructions of cuttings. And that was on our cutting listings in December and January. But now that we're selling trees, those videos don't really apply. So uh, I figured I'd make a video telling you guys what I do with a plant that I had received in the mail from somebody. Um, and yeah. I also have um, been getting, you can see here, some alpine strawberries. Not just the alpines, but the actual strawberries. I think we we may have mentioned the alpines, I think, in last week's episode. But uh, I've been getting more of them pretty consistently. The pineapple flavor is getting a bit better. The overall, they're getting a bit tastier. But um, I think they need a little bit more water, and they might be a bit better and um that's what i'm kind of hoping for because where they're at is in a bunch of peat moss and um it's quite dry because the low tunnels have been over top of the peat moss and a lot of that peat moss has dried up what i also did recently was take off the low tunnels there's a video coming out on that recently pretty soon as well and like i said in the beginning of this episode there is just so much different things going on there's so many videos that um i'm also trying to like move away i did a poll on um on youtube and if i can bring up the poll let me see if i can find the poll for you guys uh your channel let's see here and then the community tab so i did a poll and about half of you guys actually said that you watch about one to two of my videos a week that's what I actually expected. I thought that number would be a bit higher. Um, 
than 50 percent and it's awesome that a lot of you guys are watching like every video i put out um those people who are watching this episode of, of fruit talk are probably in this three to four or five plus videos per week category some of you may have even commented on the uh on the community page um i'm trying to do a different just a little bit different content now we're going to move towards because the algorithm on youtube really is not uh fun <laughs> let's put it like that it's just it needs some work um and it doesn't really benefit me um somebody who is actually trying to put out good information on the internet um in a more longer form way so um shorter videos are, are king you really want to try to get them around 10 minutes um and if you can get them around 10 minutes like exactly at 10 minutes every time you're going to be even better um also you know i've been trying to work on my thumbnails a bit more um but the content really needs to change as well because I'm not necessarily going to shorten all my videos, but I'm going to do, I think they're also sort of punishing you if you put out more videos. Um, it's a fact. I've known this for a long time that half the videos I put out, most people that are subscribers or watch my videos pretty religiously don't even see them. And it's proof right here. I mean, half of you guys only watch one to two of the videos um so i <laughs> i figure maybe you know it's not necessarily that they're not seeing them they just might not have time but and also maybe they just don't want to watch more than one or two videos which is fine that's fine with me it doesn't bother me um what i think though is happening across the board the unless you're in this five or more video category you're just not seeing all the videos I put out. And I've known this, like I said, for years that the algorithm is not really, uh, it's pretty biased towards the overall performance of the videos that you're putting out. So if your video in the first couple hours does really well compared to other videos in the first couple hours, more of your subscribers are going to see that particular video. And therefore, it's going to get more views and it's therefore going to potentially even attract um, people who are not your subscribers and new viewers. Um, whereas if I put out a video every day, let's say seven days a week, um, most of the time you're going to need to really follow my channel to be able to watch those videos. You're going to need to have that notification button hit, right? That bell button it just seems like a lot of the way the algorithm works kind of punishes the vlogger and that's sort of how I do my videos in a vlog form in a way in an educational vlog form and I like doing that I don't mind it I don't mind getting less viewers but um, I want to try something a little different and I think this is also going to be enjoyable for everybody I've been trying to do something different for a while and I can't really figure it out because I need a, a GoPro and the GoPro has to really be, it has to work like it has to, there's so many different things that have to like kind of go together with this GoPro to have it all sort of, you know, <laughs> actually work. And maybe I could buy a GoPro, you know, I did buy a cheaper version of it and it just even getting all the different attachments and pieces and things and it just it just didn't work um, so I really struggled with getting my the knockoff version I guess to work the way that I wanted but if I were it was able to do it like that it'd be totally different content and it actually be very entertaining I think for people to watch and it would see it would show you guys a very different side of growing food a very informative side yet also very entertaining um, that people are not necessarily exposed to there this has never really been done at least that I can tell so I would love to do that if I can figure it out maybe I should just spend the money 
on the uh, the GoPro. But um, I also want to do a different form of content as well, where sort of what I did in a recent video is I've talked about in one video, harvesting garlic, maintenance on my grapevines, and then also doing a chop and drop on the comfrey. But I just didn't have enough time to do all three of those things. I gave each one of them five minutes each, explained what I was doing. It was clear, it was concise, but it wasn't necessarily as in depth and you didn't really get a great view of really what I was doing. Um, yeah, so I just feel like if, um, I feel like that could work out really well in having, you know, instead of having more videos, as I mentioned, having more videos is just not really all that great in terms of the algorithm. Um, but instead of having fewer videos, and I know a lot of you guys have said over the years, quality over quantity, right? So that's what we're sort of thinking about right now is quality over quantity. Uh, as much as I like putting out a video every day, it was fun. It was a challenge. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense um, for some of it. If I can combine certain things together and show you a broader range of things, I think people will be more interested. So that's what we're going to do. Um, that's what I've been noticing is that, you know, you can only really do one video on pinching. You know, you can only do one video on growing fruit trees in containers. Once that video sort of takes off, you don't really w need to do another one like that, right? Unless you have new information and things you want to share, which I've always had and I've always done. Excuse me, guys, I just need some water. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's sort of the direction that I, I would like to go in. So we're going <coughs> to we're gonna keep doing it like that. Excuse me, guys. And um, we're going to try doing it like that. We're going to see what happens. And in all honesty, I think it's going to be more fun, more entertaining. I've already been seeing a huge bump in viewership in the last uh, – in the last month, mainly because of the season, but I think some of it has a lot to do with what it is that I'm doing differently now with the content. And it really is like a very slight difference. Um, but you know, sort of enough about that. I, I don't know if many of you guys are really interested in all that, but um, what else is going on is that, like I said, we left off with these low tunnels. The low tunnels came off. We talked about the results what the low tunnels really did in uh, like a 45 day window. I'm going to keep including you guys in or cluing you guys in as we go throughout the season. I have noticed a number of trees are unfortunately in a state of hormonal imbalance, which is really what I was worried about. There were some things that I thought about doing um, like uh, scoring the bark and also pinching. And I'm not really sure that I would just want to do that. Um, I'm not really sold on it. I guess I could try it again this year. I don't know. There was other things going on in my mind. And uh, I was hoping that some of the trees were not in hormonal imbalance. And I just needed to be a bit more patient. But I pinched a number of branches to see what would happen. And some of the trees are, in fact, in hormonal imbalance. So now I need to make a little bit of a judgment call. Do I want to mess with the trees and, you know, potentially even pinch all the shoots? Or should I just wait and then sometime down the road here in the season, uh, these trees will get out of that and uh, potentially fruit quite heavily for me? So I don't know what I'm going to do. Those are my options, I guess. Um, but overall, the low tunnel is done phenomenal. The results are clear. And it was only on the figs for about half the time that it would have been. So if I had them on there for double the amount of time, I mean, the results would be insane. I don't even know if I really would have some of the issues I'm having right now with the hormonal imbalance because of how the way that the heat works with that and also 
you know, in the future when these trees become more mature and I keep building upon that permanent structure of the spurs um, or like even a low cordon system you could do, I think the issues with hormonal imbalance will pretty much go away with time. And I don't necessarily know how to fix this right now, but it would be interesting to try something. Um, I will say this. The results are so incredible that um, my LSU Huye, as an example, which really did well, it was uh, one of one of the you know maybe twenty-ish trees I would say that really got off to a, a nice start. Maybe fifteen to twenty trees that got off to a really great start in those low tunnels and really benefited from it because they have enough age and they really dug themselves in enough. Um, LSU Huye was one of them and it has grown quite vigorously like the others, but it's also now putting out fruit, which is, in, which is really, really impressive because it's not having any hormonal imbalance. It's doing exactly what I want and it's actually putting out fruit. So maybe there'll be some point down the road where I do some sort of decision on, I make some sort of decision decision on varieties that a lot of it revolves around the hormonal imbalance because some figs, when you just cut them back really hard, they are very easily put back into that immaturity state almost where they have the wrong hormone balance going on and uh, they just tend to just grow and grow and grow and it's just not something you want so um, I don't know if certain varieties will inevitably shake that or if this is going to be a permanent thing that I just have to deal with forever with certain varieties so if that's the case then I need to pull certain varieties because I already know that you can cut back certain varieties and it just doesn't matter they will produce no matter what uh, because their precocity, because of their just over willingness to put out fruit is, uh, is above and beyond others. So that may end up being a very desirable trait for me in this system in the future. And we'll see. There's a lot of changes and things that already were kind of in the works with all of this just this spring but by the end of the season it'll be really interesting i think to see what what happens um and what my decisions and thought process turn into at the end of the year now i'll tell you this we talked about our fig season on the youtube channel not too long ago and i was pretty pessimistic pretty negative about it the season's looking a lot better than i had originally thought and I don't know why exactly I was so pessimistic. I think it just had a lot to do with where we were at in the season and what things looked like. We're definitely like a week behind, I would say. Um, I'm not going to have nearly as many fruits in July. Um, but the fruit that's going to ripen in mid to late August is looking pretty decent. And normally... You know, I would be hopefully getting a lot more in early August, but this year that's probably not going to be the case. However, I think the fruit that is going to come in is going to be in such high quantity that uh, it's going to be something special uh, this year in that pretty much all of the varieties I have in pots that are mature will fruit, which is quite something. Um so they're doing quite well. Um, the younger trees are also doing very well. It's amazing how many of them actually are putting out fruit and how vigorously they're growing at the same time. And uh, the in-ground trees, some of them are in hormonal imbalance, which I hope they'll eventually shake. But others like LSU Huye, like I said, are, are putting out fruit now. So I would expect maybe, you know, just a crap ton of fruit from LSU Huye by the end of the season. And that's a really wonderful fig. Um, it's really quite impressive, actually, how much fruit is going to be on that tree. You'll see. Uh, I'll document it. It's going to be 
outrageous, actually. Um, so to see fruits forming now on June 1st from an in-ground tree is really what you want. Um, that's really even without plastic, without some extra help. That's like the most ideal scenario because, you know, 90 days fast forward, you're looking at um, September 1st, but you may even get off of these trees. Um, you may even get them like 80 days or 75 days. So, you know, I might be looking at mid-August with some of these fruits from LSU Huye. You never know. Um, which is realistically when I had figured a lot of my in-ground trees without any assistance, once they, once they got mature, when they would fruit um, would be around August 15th. So, you know, that's, that's wonderful to sort of be getting that on such a young tree. Obviously the green, the, uh, the low tunnels helped, but I'm also gonna get some fruit, believe it or not, around that same time, August 15th, on trees that have not received any help from the low tunnels. So it's great to see that no matter what's going on, low tunnel or not, the figs are doing well. Um, and they're really putting on a lot of growth and uh, it's, it's quite, um, it's quite a sight. So the other th thing I wanted to mention in this video is that we're going to talk soon about row cover. And I want to talk to you guys now about my garden because I've learned enough, learned a lot, I should say, this year about the garden and different timings and different things and just a new way, a new perspective of looking at the garden um, from a more really from an unusual standpoint, but row cover is an absolute must. And we're gonna talk about these row covers um, and why I think they're so important for even somebody that's just a backyard hobbyist. Yeah, it is a little bit more money, um, but the season extension that you can get from these things really makes or breaks certain crops that you can have good success with or really poor success with. Um, so having, you know, mesh or fleece is wonderful. What I would recommend actually is that I'm going to have three different covers over the length of the season. And it depends on the crop. It depends on the time of the year. So in the beginning of the year, no matter what it is, we'll do plastic. The plastic is going to increase the warmth in the soil the most. Once things get too warm or, you know, probably in early May, um, I can move over to things like mesh and maybe even mid-April or something like that. You know, if things are getting too warm for certain crops, that's not necessarily a good thing. So we move away from the plastic and then we start using, uh, actually not mesh, we use fleece because there's a little bit of a distinction here between them. And this is actually what the fleece looks like. And the fleece is really not a very durable material what it does do is give the plants about four degrees of, uh, of temperatures, also protection from frost. Um, it's wonderful for your early spring crops. Been using it for years. Um, I just ordered some that was in a lot longer of a length because you, uh, you really need to replace this stuff like every two years. It's a shame that something like this will break so easily and I wish that they, they change it in some way that it was like the best of both worlds that it was durable and gave the frost the, the warmth to these plants um, but I haven't really seen anything like like this the next thing once things get actually too warm like they are right now is that I don't necessarily need any more warmth um, however I do need some protection from insects so this is where like an insect fleece netting or I'm sorry a mesh netting would come in and the mesh would go over top of these hoop houses or these low tunnels here, or even a cold frame or whatever it is that you had, a raised bed, something. You could even just drape it over the plants, but uh, this will protect a lot of crops from certain pests that make things very difficult in the summer. And things that I really strongly consider using this for is the, um, even like small seedlings that you plant, if you direct seed some things, you have issues with, um, uh, man, what's the name of that pest? 
oh, they're really small and they get all these little holes in all the ceilings. Um, flea beetle. I think that's what they're called. How could I forget? It's definitely flea something. But anyway, the, the flea beetles, yeah, that, that's got to be it. Yeah, so the flea beetles, <laughs> excuse me, guys. The flea beetles are, uh, you know, a problem for young seedlings if you plant them and they're not already that established. Once it gets a bit warm, they really start to be active. And they're, they're active right now. They're kind of causing a little bit of havoc on my eggplants and peppers that I direct seeded, which in all honesty should really not have occurred, but it did and that's the reality of what I'm sort of dealing with uh, this year and that the peppers and eggplants will just be a bit later than normal, but you know, it is what it is. So the flea beetle, it's protection against that. Um, there's also white fly on the brassicas. There is the cucumber beetle on a number of the squash, the, uh, the cucumbers, obviously the melons, all kinds of things like that uh, need protection from those because of the fusarium. We'll we've talked a lot about that on this uh on this podcast so i'm thinking you gotta have the the insect netting for a number of these things i mean it's not just those but i think those are the big ones that come to mind that like you know absolutely need some sort of barrier there what's also nice is that these covers not only protect them from insects but also critters so you don't have to like use a you know, a fence or a deer fence, I guess it'd be nice against deer to have a deer fence, but you know, for smaller animals and birds, these things work wonders. Um, they're not really going to get underneath this stuff if you tie it down and, and have right, the right, the right measures in, in place. Um, so the fleece and the mesh are really important and that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about in another video, the different covers, why I use them at what times and what crops and things like that. And they're going to just be interchanged throughout the season, depending on what time of the year it is. So now it's super warm. I don't want the fleece. I don't want the plastic. I want the mesh. That's uh, not going to give the plants any extra warmth. However, it is going to protect them from, from insects. So uh, that's what we're going to do. And, um, it's probably the best way to go about it, honestly. Um, you'd be surprised, I think, how much of this stuff needs protection. And if you can protect it, it just makes these growing these things so much easier. It's like a joke. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to really pay attention to um, certain crops. I said that I wasn't going to grow. We're now growing them. And we're going to try to protect them with uh, insect netting. I'd like to get myself a little bit more. I did finally get some sort of promotion. I've been getting a lot of requests now that I hit 20,000 subscribers. People have been really asking me for every little thing. I've been spammed basically um, with all these different products. And I have to say most of them are junk. And uh, there is one that I'm really looking forward to at some point, which is actually, um, someone on the channel that's a viewer um, messaged me about like a humidity and temperature sensor and it would be nice to have the ability to also track um, with some sort of app or software that could track all of it every day for me so that I can bring this up at any time and see the exact temperatures and humidities in there um, and have hard data on it. Um, so that's obviously really, really interesting. Um, I'm waiting for that. It's really cool to see, by the way, what some of these people are messaging you about um, in terms of promoting. But also I've realized that I just have certain things that I'm looking for. You know, I wish that there was a place I could go to as a, uh, an influencer and just say, this is what I want. If you can get me this, I'll promote it. You know what I mean? And it, and it also would drive a lot of um, innovation because if you, because I know exactly what I want. In fact, I already thought of a couple products that 
it that could make whatever it is ex that already exists better or even something totally new. And um, you know, if if I just had somebody who had like this manufacturing background, you know, I would work with them to create this product and then I would promote it. Um, it's just that uh, that doesn't seems a lot more difficult. You know, it's easier said than done, right? So um, maybe if somebody would approach me, some kind of manufacturer on something, I could tell them exactly what would make them a bunch of money. Um, and I would like to get a piece of it for sure. <laughs> um, or maybe at some point I'll just do it myself. I don't know because one of these things is so darn um, important and easy to use that would that a lot of people would be flocked just absolutely flocked to that uh it doesn't make sense i think not to not to create this type of thing and have it in such high quantity um so yeah that's that's um that's i guess what i'm talking about here with the with the promotions but if the promotion is coming in soon that we did with actually some of these row covers so i did get some insect netting i did get some uh fleece and mesh so we will do a you know a review of those products but also with the plastic and talk just talk about row covers in general um and why i believe that these things are so darn important um because they are and it's not just for people like you know farmers legitimate farmers we should be using this stuff it really is a one-time cost in terms of the the mesh and the and most of the plastic can last you quite a long time so you know you can really uh, it's it's a wise investment I think if you're using it over many years um, I think it's totally worth it now some other thoughts on the garden is that we believe it or not we had uh, harvested all of our garlic I have been noticing more pests this year um, at least it seems like there's more problems than in prior years and I don't necessarily know why um, it just seems like the the problems maybe if you just keep doing enough of the same thing eventually the the pest or whatever it is shows up that could be the the answer um fortunately they don't seem to be like the worst pests in the world but the one on the garlic i don't know the name of it exactly but it has really ruined my garlic this year um it pretty much digs itself into the stem of the garlic and even the bulb of the garlic uh it seems to be mostly underground they look like uh, larvae of some kind. Um, weird looking bugs. But I know that there's a pest that somebody's been telling me about with garlic and alliums for a while. I'm like, nah. They, uh, <laughs> they're they completely problem free. There's no issues with them. They're so easy to grow. But this year we did. We had them. And um, I think it honestly ruined my garlic harvest to an extent however i'm not too upset about it because the garlic is harvested it is uh now curing we peeled off some of the outer sheaths just to clean it up a bit we have plenty of sheaths left to uh get a good wrapping around the bulbs we trimmed off the roots now they're just hanging out in the sun for a couple days before i bring them in here and hang them up to dry and cure for about a month and we'll have that garlic for a year. Some of it is ruined and some of it won't store for nearly that long, which um, is really my biggest concern with the whole thing is that this pest has sort of ruined the garlic in, a, in a, such a way that I won't be able to store the garlic nearly as long as I did this year. This year it's been over a year of my garlic being in the fridge um, and they still look great. Some of them look fantastic. So it just, you know, it kind of stinks. It is what it is though. Um, 
I'm not too upset about it because what I'm thinking in the future is actually something pretty darn smart, which I saw on Charles Dowding's videos, is that he was harvesting his onions, no, his garlic. I think he was doing a garlic harvest. And then what he had planted in between the garlic was um, some like tomatoes, peppers, or eggplants, or squash, or zucchini, or melons, whatever it is. Um, some heat loving thing that can then be plopped in between the rows of the garlic. Then when the garlic comes out June 1st, you have those warmer temperatures now anyway. And then that plant that loves the heat can just take off. And that seems like a really great use of space. I mean, absolutely fantastic that I'm looking forward to using quite a bit, not just with garlic, but with onions in that the onions that we're going to use and do um, in the future, we're going to have two different types. We'll have one that we grow from seed over the winter time and then plant those out in very, very early spring. Um, that's kind of what we've been doing for years. That's what we have right now. They're very far behind. They don't look too great. Um, I could have probably transplanted them better, gotten to the, gotten them in the ground earlier. Also had them transplanted them in at a smaller size, had a more established bed. There was too many things this year, too many variables of things that we just had to put everything together at last minute because of the virus. And, um, it kind of messed with everything. Um, but the onions, we'll, we'll get something out of them. I'm sure by the end of the season, um, you know, probably I think sometime in July or early August, I think is when we harvest them. So we, we have some time for them to get some size, but they're not going to be the biggest onions, unfortunately. Um, however, the other way you can do it is that you can start your onions like, I don't know, sometime in the summer um, and then plant them out in the garden um, to have them grow. Um, and then they get some size to them, sort of like the garlic does, how you plant that in the fall. And then they, the following year, they resume their growth and they just take off. And um, a lot of them, it's like kind of like planting them from sets, right? the sets really take off and they have a lot of energy in them and they produce a pretty decently sized bulb uh, or an onion. I guess you could call it an onion bulb, but uh, or head of onion. I don't know. But anyway, you can, <laughs> you can definitely do that. Um, a lot of people struggle and I've heard this a lot with people struggling with them, the sets and the overwintered onions, they bolt too soon. They flower too soon. And then therefore you don't get like the biggest heads of garlic of, uh, of you don't get the biggest onions possible. Um, so that's, I think the way that I'm seeing it is that it's not necessarily needing to be the biggest onion possible either because there's two different harvests, right? There's the earlier crop of the ones that you overwintered like the garlic uh, or you would do a hard neck garlic, I should say. And then there's also the second harvest when you would plant them out in the spring. And those come in later in the season, largely based off of day length. Um, so you get a big onion harvest at the beginning and then a, you know, an equally probably as big onion harvest later, which then stores for the remainder of the season, hopefully those last all winter. And then you can get yourself onions again around now, so June 1st. Do the same thing with the garlic. In between the garlic and the onions, you plant the heat-loving crops, and they take off, and they love it, and it makes a whole lot of sense, and I'm in. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm really excited for that, to be doing that next year, because that's gonna make a lot better use of my space, and I'm also gonna have onions right now, where I don't. So we'll do the sets, basically, a form of the sets. And um, yeah, it'll be pretty cool. Uh, now, what else do I want to talk to you guys about? 
Um, some other things we're doing. Rejuvenation pruning. We did a lot of rejuvenation pruning. This was the most extreme case of what I did this year. And this is my Coldenon Blanc, my prized Coldenon Blanc. I cut off the entire tree. And then we planted this in the ground. Why? Because the Coldenon Blanc is not healthy. It's not very strong. It needs some help. And uh, probably needed some root pruning. It needed a large amount of rejuvenation pruning, as you see here. And we're going to get some new sprouts from the base. Um, and it's just, we did a video on this. It's pretty incredible. Um, you'll see the results. Looking forward to it. Um, with the cuttings here of the Col de Don Blanc, we're also doing some summer rooting of fig cuttings, which I also did a video on. And uh, yeah, I think that is, oh, there's one other thing I'm blanking on here. Oh, we're also doing some summer pruning now even though it's not technically summer it definitely feels like summer and a lot of my stone fruits throughout the yard my pears my apples are growing quite vigorously and i have topped a lot of them to summer prune them at least the first pruning of the year um, i'll probably do multiple we'll see and this is going to help keep them more size controlled and at the same time allow them to put out better uh, more high, a higher production of fruits in future years uh, because when you summer prune it really helps the trees form flower buds and and spurs so um, yeah that's what we're gonna do I may even try it on my pomegranates and that's sort of the last thing I think that was quite interesting that happened recently is the pomegranates are flowering and these were not in the greenhouse at all. Um, and I purposely did this because they don't do well in the greenhouse. I just can't water them enough. They dry out too quickly. They also leaf out too quickly. And then therefore they never really got a great start to the season because they are just getting pounded on in that greenhouse. So what we did this year is a more natural wake up process and now it's June 1st around that time and I'm seeing the first flowers forming. The only issue I have is whether or not these flowers are going to be pollinated and that's the big question. That's the big the big Megillah here. Um, who knows? I hope so. I really do because I want to be able to finally say we got some homegrown pomegranates. I know it's possible. I know it's, it's actually quite easy to do um, but now we can finally get this down under wraps and learn a lot more about these pomegranates you know it was my third favorite fruit um, sort of when I really started growing fruits but I haven't really had one homegrown to be able to really put it back up there at that third spot you know um, who knows who really knows um, what the homegrown pomegranate in Pennsylvania is going to taste like? Um, if it, if I'm going to find a certain variety that's better than wonderful, that's going to really wow me, um, we'll have to see. So that is sort of the conclusion here of Fruit Talk. I want to thank you guys here for watching this one. Um, check out our trees if you guys are interested on Figbid.com. Also, consider supporting us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash rossratty. If you guys need some consulting services, we offer that on our blog, figboss.com. You can see the links and information on that. And uh, we'll see everybody soon, all right? Take, take care and stay safe out there. See you guys next week.